everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, I'm reading a comment from Kimberly Olson uh, in regards to the upcoming Blood Moon that's going to happen on May 15th. She says, Jared, I'm curious to hear your thoughts regarding the upcoming Blood Moon beginning on May 15th. There appears to be a chiasmus of Blood Moons. If you don't know what a chiasmus is, it's a it's basically a poetic way of writing. Um, it's like a Hebrew poetic way of writing where uh, essentially, you structure the sentences so that they kind of mirror each other, and in the middle is the main point of, um, uh, you know, the, the chiasmus structure. You know, so it goes like C B A B C, and then A. That middle sentence is the one that uh, is that 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 uh, they're trying to point to as the main focus of the idea that they're trying to convey okay so basically what she's saying is that uh there's a chiasmus of blood moons so if you were to chart out the blood moons and then uh, in a blood moon that we're talking about a lunar eclipse you know that when there's a lunar eclipse um the, the moon will turn red and there's people that have um studied this and kind of charted it and <clears throat> excuse me, maybe you've already heard about this. If you just do a Google search for blood moons on Jewish holidays, uh, you'll come up with any number of different things where uh, I guess people have noticed a pattern of blood moons occurring on Jewish feast days. Uh, Jewish feast days, that's something that we talk about some, uh, semi-frequently on the channel just because it seems like even though... Uh, now in this last dispensation, we don't uh, specifically observe the feast days the way that they did back in Old Testament times. It does seem like things still do happen on those days, including when Joseph Smith received the gold plates on Rosh Hashanah, and also when Elijah came to the Kirtland Temple on First Fruits. So it seems like they're still significant today, even though they've been fulfilled by Christ when he came. And uh, we've talked about how, like, with Passover, it, it's almost like we do observe it, in a sense, um, by partaking of the sacrament. Because we know that the the Seder that they were... Anyway, I'm not going to get into all that, but you get what I'm saying. So, uh, there, there are people, uh, most it seems like mostly evangelical people that have noticed um, this occurring, where you have blood moons that are happening on these different feast days, like here's one that happened on Pentecost, otherwise known as the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot, uh, so on and so, so on and so forth. Um, I haven't looked into this too closely, uh, but that's not to that's not to say that I don't find it interesting, or even um, there might be something to it. There, there really could be. I just haven't devoted enough time to looking into it. The first time that I heard about it was from my dad before he passed away. I think I was in Fort Hood at the time uh, in Texas in the Army. And um, it piqued my interest because there, there was a blood moon that we watched while we were there. I was living on post and uh, us and then the neighbor, she came over and we, we watched the blood moon together. Uh, while we were having a fire outside, it was very nice. So uh, I have to I have to look into it closer, but let's look at this one because there are some pretty interesting things that seem to be in conjunction with this one. But first, let me let me finish off her her uh, comment. There appear there appears to be a chiasmus of blood moons, with May fifteenth being the center. All <clears throat> excuse me, also corresponding with the Jewish holiday Pesach Sheni. So that could be important right here, Pesach Sheni. If you've been watching the channel for a while or if you're familiar with the feast days, Pesach is essentially the Passover observance, the week-long Passover observance, okay? So we're going to learn about Pesach Sheni, uh, which happens when this blood moon occurs in something else that's happening on May 15th. Um yeah, there's some interesting things. Now, as far as this chiasmus goes, uh, in the research for this video, I wasn't able to find exactly what she was referring to. Um, so, Kimberly, if you don't mind, uh, maybe I'll do a follow-up video. If you could uh, email me or, or just put in the comments uh, where to find that, then I'll, I'll take a closer look at it. Okay, so 
the first thing that I found interesting was that on the 15th, uh, we're having this worldwide devotional for young adults with President and Sister Nelson. And <laughs> these are always interesting. I'm going to go over this after we talk about the blood moons, uh, Pesach Sheni, and so forth, because um, probably since 20, well, I don't know, because I haven't like listened to all of them, but I can say that since 2016, at least, some of the most like explicit information has come out of these devotionals that have to do with the last days and with the second coming. Okay, uh, we've gone over other devotionals like this, and uh, I'm actually going to go over a few of them, some of the key things that I've pulled out of, like here's one from Sister Nelson and President Nelson in 2016. This is back before he became prophet. Um, there was the Worldwide Youth Devotional. This wasn't Young Adults. It was the Youth Devotional in 2018. Uh, more recently, we had um, we had a thing where six of the apostles, they all took different areas of the world, and they had young adult devotionals. Uh, so the one for our area here in the United States, I think it encompassed the whole United States. I can't remember. It was done by Elder Rasband. It was incredible. I did a video um, with all my notes. So you can watch uh, either one or both. Uh, you can watch my video and all the notes that I took. Um, he said really interesting things in this one, but we're going to go over some of the key points here. But first, let's go ahead and look at uh, this eclipse that's coming up. So uh, this is on timeanddate.com. And one thing that kind of like catches my attention right away, if you look at these two maps right here, is that it's pretty much like almost exactly centered on South America. Okay. If you were to like match up the center with a, a geographic location, South America is almost entirely in the center of this. I don't know if that means anything, but I find that interesting. Okay. Now here, here's an animation. Okay. Let's look at this animation. Pay attention to the little moon graphic right here. I'm not going to expand it because like with what I'm using right now, I don't think it'll show the things. So I'll, I'll just have to manually zoom in. So look at, look at this moon graphic right here as it crosses South America. It's almost like it, when it crosses the um, border or when it makes, when it makes, uh, so to speak, landfall uh, is when it changes. And then when it leaves, that's when it changes back. So w watch this. Okay, it's like red right now, red over South America, leaving South America, and then it goes back. Isn't that interesting? I, I think that's pretty interesting. I think that's pretty interesting. Well, I don't know, maybe that's just showing, no, th that's like the time, that's, yeah, that's when it ha okay yeah so it, it is in eclipse as it's crossing over south america it's going over uh let's see brazil bolivia paraguay uh northern argentina maybe a little tiny the tip the, nor the northern tip of uruguay uh peru and chile so, okay, so that's interesting. So th this is the main affair, this, this is the main area um, in question. It looks like we'll be able to see it, uh, at least many of us here in the United States will be able to see it in its uh, full, um, you know, the, get the full effect of it. Um, let's see. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so here is the Hebrew calendar. Now, the thing to realize when it comes to uh, these eclipses and full moons and the Hebrew calendar is that the Hebrew calendar is based on uh, the lunar cycles, right? So when it's a new moon, uh, that's when the month changes from one, one month to another. And then in the middle of the Hebrew month, like on the 15th, that's when you would have a full moon. And so as we look at this year, the 15th of 
Iyar, which is the month that we're in right now, uh, is it starts at sundown on the, the 15th on our calendar, and then it goes into the next day on the 16th. So it starts on our 15th, and that's when the lunar eclipse is going to be. So, so technically speaking, it is happening on uh, the 15th of Iyar, and uh, Pesach Sheni, that begins on the 14th, and then the full day is on the 15th until sundown. So it doesn't seem that it's it's bright on uh, Pesach Sheni, but I, I think it's still in conjunction with it and related to it. So what, what is Pesach Sheni? Well, you'll notice, okay, so up here, here's Pesach in April. And uh, this particular year, it was from the 16th to the 23rd of April. And then just a couple weeks later, we have Pesach Sheni. So whenever I'm, whenever I'm learning anything about Judaism, I'd like to go to Kabad.org. It is a, it's a Hasidic website that's designed to, to reach out to Jews that uh, maybe have distanced distance themselves in the faith or... Um, it's like it's like them trying to get more Jews to be more observant of Judaism. It's essentially uh, an Orthodox. Sometimes you, you might call it an ultra Orthodox group, and uh, they have this website and has a lot of good information. Okay, so what is Pesach Sheni, uh, the second Passover? Uh, what does Pesach Sheni mean? Pesach Sheni means second Passover sacrifice. It marks the day when someone who was unable to participate in the Passover offering in the proper time would observe the mitzvah or that which is commandment would observe the commandment exactly one month later okay so for whatever reason if you miss the first one it's a day for you to still um, get on board it's a it's a time for you to still be able to do it it is customary to mark this day by eating matzah and that's uh, unleavened bread, if possible, and by omitting uh, takanun from the prayer services. Takanun, that is the penitential prayers recited on all non-festive days. Um, how Pesach Sheni came about? A year after the Exodus, God instructed the people of Israel to bring the Passover offering on the afternoon of the 14th of Nisan. So, Again, let's look at um, let's look at Nissan and Passover this year. So uh, it actually Passover the Passover week starts on the fifteenth. Okay, so it starts on sundown. So this year uh, it was on the sixteenth, but it actually started at sundown on the fifteenth, and the day of the fifteenth is the fourteenth of Nissan. So that's the day that Christ was crucified. Um, on the Hebrew calendar, and uh, and then at sundown, that begins the Passover observance, and that's when you have the Seder meal or the Passover meal. Okay, so fourteenth of Nisan. Let's go. Let's go back. Okay, uh, offering on the afternoon of fourteenth of Nisan, and to eat it that evening, roast it over the fire. Uh, because by that time it would be the 15th of Nisan, ro roasted it over fire together with matzah and bitter herbs. Again, matzah is the unleavened bread, as they had done the previous year just before they left Egypt. Quote, There were, however, certain persons who had become ritually impure through contact with the dead body and <clears throat> could not therefore prepare the Passover offering on that day. They approached Moses and Aaron, and they said, why should we be deprived and not be able to present God's offerings in its time amongst the children of Israel? In response to their plea, God established the 14th of Ayar as a, a day of the uh, for the second Passover, Pesach Sheni. Okay, so it's like a second chance, basically. For anyone who was unable to bring the offering on its appointed time in the previous month. What Pesach Sheni means... The day represents the quote unquote second chance. Okay, so let, let's stop right there. Uh, if, and I'm not saying that this blood moon does necess necessarily 
have significance, but if it does, um, it's, it's a little concerning that it's happening with the second chance observance, don't you think? Because um, you could say, uh, instead of second chance, you could say last chance. Now, I did my video about is this the last second or the last general conference before the second coming. Uh, I'm not saying that it is. I was just exploring the possibility. There was really interesting things that happened this conference. Uh, I would recommend that you go watch that video. Um, you know, I just did it a few, a couple of weeks ago. But um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I look at things like, let me pull up my, let me pull up my spreadsheet. Let's take a look at the uh, first fruits calendar thing that I put together. Here we are. So right now for 2022 and not the whole year, it just goes until September, 2022. Uh, we have we're in a Shemitah year, which is a sabbatical year. Happens every seven years. It, it's basically the Sunday, or sorry, uh, if if, it, if it's like in Judaism, it's the Saturday. It's this it's the Sabbath of years. Okay, it's the Sabbath of years. And um, so we're in a Shemitah year. This year, the Passover week started on the same day that it did during the, the last week of Christ's life, meaning that Pesach 1 was on Saturday and Friday was uh, Pesach Eve or the 14th of Nisan, the day of the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb. Okay, so that doesn't always happen because, uh, again, since Pesach is tied to the lunar cycle, it can, be, it can start any day uh, during the week. So, this year is one of relatively few years when it, it happens to be in sync with when uh, the last week of Christ's life. Okay, so Shemitah year in sync with the same, the last week of Christ's life. Uh, and then uh, both first fruits and Easter were on the same day, on the 17th. Easter is essentially the Christian observance of first fruits. We, we no longer celebrate it as first fruits, uh, which is on the 16th of Nisan. We observe it as Easter, uh, commemorating when Christ fulfilled first fruits and became the first fruits, the first uh, one resurrected. Okay, so as you can see from this calendar here, uh, all the red, that means that it, you know, whenever you see red, it doesn't match up. So yeah, it's not always that Easter and first fruits match up, but it did this year. So it's a Shemitah year. Uh, Passover started on the same day that it did in, during the last week of Christ's life. And Easter and first fruits were on the same day. And they were both on the 17th. And you, you'll just have to go back if you're new. We've been talking a lot about the seven, the number 17. It comes up a lot. President Nelson is the 17th uh, president of the church. Uh, I've been kind of looking at it as, well, we've, we've done a lot of research uh, from BYU and other places how 7 and 10 are basically, they're similar numbers. They both represent perfection and completion uh, in a couple different ways. So when you put those together, if you add them up, it's 17. And that is how you know, Old Testament peoples and New Testament peoples, how they viewed numbers. Uh, they viewed numbers for what they were, but they also had symbolic meaning. And it was a way of communicating ideas. So, but this isn't a video about 17. You'll just have to go back and watch my other videos. Uh, for those of you who know, then you know. Okay, so it does seem, it does seem to be a special year, okay, because of this. Uh, because President Nelson seems to have achieved his goal, if he did have a goal, of completing or at least announcing a hundred temples. Because we, we've looked at that before, how 
that was the goal of President Hinckley was to have a hundred completed temples by the by the end of the year two thousand. He didn't announce a hundred, but he wanted to have a hundred done constructed in operation by the end of the year two thousand. Uh, well, it, it seems like something kind of similar happened with President Nelson, but in this case, it was announcing a hundred temples. Now, if if he lives beyond uh, this year, then he's he's going to be the oldest apostle or prophet uh, of this entire dispensation, going all the way back to Joseph Smith. So, you know, there probably would be more temples announced, but I just think that it's interesting that this year he uh, he completed that goal by announcing 17 temples. He completed 100 by announcing 17 temples. <laughs> okay, uh, the last sentence of his uh, last talk, this conference, uh, almost seemed to indicate that uh, maybe we'd be meeting the Lord soon, whether that's Adam on Diamond or something else. Um, again, we don't know how lo how far apart these different events are. Adam on Diamond, Christ coming to New Jerusalem, Christ coming to the Jews, Christ going, uh, you know, appearing to the world. Uh, I, I don't think we know how long apart those are. And I was just wondering if it's possible that Adam on Diamond would happen this year. Just because all these things that are lining up, all these different things are that are lining up, okay? If we go back to the Hebrew calendar, um, where is it? Here it is. If we go back to the Hebrew calendar, I was wondering about Pentecost this year. I'm not saying that it's gonna happen, but could it be that Adam on Ayaman, at least Adam on Ayaman for the masses of the church, would happen on Pentecost. Uh, the reason why is because Pentecost corresponds to when Israel became uh, betrothed to the Lord at Sinai. That, that's, what, that's what Shavuot is. It commemorates when Moses received the Ten Commandments and when Israel as a nation became the Lord's people. But uh, from what we've studied on the channel, it seems like that was the betrothal, which is as good as marriage, but the actual marriage uh, happens later. In, in uh, Jewish tradition, it's it's a year later. So could it be, could it be that this observance, Shavuot, Pentecost, would be the same day that he would marry his people at Adam on Diamon? Maybe. I don't know. We'll see what happens, but I'm just saying that I wouldn't be surprised. So, in other words, if we're having this this uh, blood moon on last chance, okay? If it's high, if it's highlighting last chance, and then exactly three weeks later we have Pentecost, uh, and and if it is Adam on Diamond uh, on that day or those two days or whatever, um. It would all work out really nice. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. You don't don't get upset. I know there's people that are already no, it's impossible. Well, we'll see, won't we? But it's just something that's interesting to observe. It's something that's interesting to observe. Okay. So, by the way, today uh the day of this recording is the 11th and we're on the on the 25th day of the Omer count. The Omer count begins on first fruits. <clears throat> it's a 50 day count that ends with Shavuot, Pentecost. Pentecost is the 50th day. So starting during the Passover week on the 16th of Nisan, which is the second day of Passover, you start the 50 day Omer count. And it counts up to 50 and on the 50th day is Pentecost. That's why it's called Pentecost. So, so uh, that's what we have going on right now. We're halfway through it as of today. We are on the 25th day. We're on the 25th day, and one, two, three, four days from now, or you could say five days from now, uh, if you're looking at the Hebrew calendar five days from now, we're going to have a blood moon. 
right after Second Chance. Pisak Shenny, Second Chance. You, you get what I'm saying? Uh, okay, so the day represents the quote unquote second chance achieved by Teshuva. What's Teshuva? Hey, pull up. There's supposed to be a little me. There's supposed to be a little drop down that, or a little thing that pops up. There it is. Teshuva means repentance, return to a Jew's true essence. So think about this. President Nelson in 2019, in his Come Follow Me talk in conference, uh, at the end, let's just pull it up. Screw it. Let's just pull it up. Come follow me, President Nelson, 2019. Okay. Let's think about, let's think about second chance, shall we? Okay. At the end of his talk, and by the way, this was the center of a chiasmus right here. This talk right here. Uh, in fact, I have it here on my tracker, my handy dandy tracker. President Nelson's talks. Okay, you see this like uh, this uh, rainbow thing here in in, um, in column E. So what ha what you have here is I noticed like well, I noticed through the course of this channel as I was doing things that there seemed to be kind of a pattern <clears throat> to his first um, his first talks here. Okay, so th this blue area at the bottom, this is his first conference, okay? He spoke five times. The next conference, right here in white, he spoke four times. His third conference, he only spoke three times. The conference after that, four times. The conference after that, five times. <clears throat> so whether he intended it or not, or whether maybe the Lord inspired it or not, the fact of the matter is the pattern is five, four, three, four, five. Chiasmus, not strictly speaking, uh, but a mirroring, what, however you want to think of it, a, a, a sim, um, symmetry, whatever. So on his uh, 11th talk, and 11 is a fascinating number, by the way, but 11th talk, come follow me. This is what he says at the end. Now, as president of his church, I plead with you who have not, who have distanced yourselves from the church, and with you who have not really yet sought to know the Savior's church has been restored, do the spiritual work to find out for yourselves and please do it now. Time is running out. And by the way, when you watch the video of this talk, and I, I would encourage you to do that, he leans into the microphone and like raises his eyebrows when he says this. As he's saying time is running out, he leans into the microphone. Also on this tracker, we've noted that the phrase running out Okay, you see it right here. I'll put it on the very far left. It, it's only ever been said two times in general conference since 1942. You see all this white space? It's said once by President Eyring in 2005. And I think that the I think that the context of this I think that the context of President Eyring saying this, and at the time he was Elder Eyring is that they had just completed all those temples that President Hinckley had announced. And it's like, and he was basically saying, you know, are we may be running out of time to do the work that we need to do, talking about doing temple work. Anyway, and then the only other time, uh, and the most like stunning thing that I've ever heard a prophet say, uh, in for me personally, uh, 2019, time is running out. And then what happens? Well, what happens this last year in uh, April 2022? Oops, not scriptures. What what is his? What's his last talk called? What's it called? Now is the time. Now is the time. And he shares this poem right here. 
that's talking about time. And he did another talk uh, with a similar name. It, it was it was called Now is the Time to Prepare. And it was 17 years ago. 17. 17 years ago, he shares a similar talk. It has the same poem, only now it's called Time. Now is the Time. And then we, we've talked about this last thing right here. Ye shall be my people and I will be your God. He says, may we be a people worthy of the Lord who said, ye shall be my people and I will be your God. And this is in the context. This is from Jeremiah, what is it? 30, 22. This is in the context of the second coming when Christ is king and he's with his people. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so when we're, when we're looking at Pesach Shani, uh, when we're looking at Pesach Shani, and it's the, the second chance, and it's time for you to uh, do Teshuva, right? The day represents the second chance achieved by Teshuva, which is a return to a Jew's true essence. It makes me think of this. Returning to a Jew, so if we're members, we're members of the church, we're Israelites, um, right? Our lineage is declared in our patriarchal blessing. So for you, Israelites, in this church, President Nelson says, I plead with you who have distanced yourselves from the church and with you who have not really sought to know that the Savior's church has been restored. Do the spiritual work to find it out for yourselves and please do it now. Time is running out. Okay, second chance. Teshuva. The power of repentance and quote-unquote return. In the words of Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak of Lubavitch, the second Passover means that it's never a lost case. Um, so, do I think that there's something special about this blood moon? Uh, I can't say for sure, but I find it pretty fascinating, given, the, given this last general conference and the one in 2019, and everything else that we've studied on this channel. Uh, I would take it seriously. If you're someone that's distanced yourself from the church or you don't really have a testimony, uh, I don't know. Maybe the 15th is kind of a warning. I don't know. And then what happens on Pentecost this year? I don't know. Maybe nothing. Maybe, maybe all this is nothing, but it doesn't hurt to observe it doesn't hurt to observe these things. Okay, so how do the Jews uh, view blood moons? Uh, this is an article that's talking about a blood moon on the 15th of Av. Av is a, is a month of theirs. Okay, so he, he's responding to this question. He says, uh, In describing future events, the prophet Joel foretells that God will set wonders in the heavens and the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of God, uh, which we view as the second coming. Uh, there's much discussion in the commentaries about the meaning of this prophecy. Many explain it to be allegorical. However, the Bible commentator, Rabbi David Kimchi, known as the Radek, 1160 to 1235, explains that when there is a total eclipse, the moon appears dark. However, there's only, however, when it is only partially covered, it, it appears red like blood, symbolizing the fall of the wicked. So according to this rabbi's interpretation, and it seems like, you know, they, they've held on to it, uh, it symbolizes the fall of the wicked. So again, if we have <clears throat> Adam on the Yaman or or even some other kind of event, th there's there's different events that are associated with the second coming. So don't think that I'm saying that this is the second coming. Don't don't think that I'm saying that it's anything specific. Although I do feel like Adam on the Yaman, if anything, is a good candidate. Um, there's any number of things that could happen. Okay, so whatever it is, 
if this is signaling something, then um, that's a little concerning, isn't it? So we just talked about how this is second chance. This is the day of second chance and returning to who you're supposed to be as a Jew. Uh, and I guess in our case, uh, you could just convert that over to becoming a true Israelite. Uh, second chance and the, the blood moon itself is uh, essentially an omen of the fall of the wicked. So coupling that together, that's that's a bit, uh, yeah, it's a bit concerning if that's what this is happening, if, if this is what's happening. Um, in other words, yes, according to some, a blood moon is indeed an omen, but an omen of the downfall of the wicked. So I guess what we should maybe take from this is just like we should anyway, how about we not be wicked? How about we make sure that we're on the right side, right? And they've been telling us everything that we need to do to be to to essentially meet the Lord. Get on the covenant path if you're not on it. And once you're on the covenant path, stay there. Discover the joy of daily repentance. Learn about God and how he works, right? President Nelson gave us five things um, to think about and do since the last conference. Okay, a full moon. Uh, as you wrote, this eclipse will take place on Tuba Av, the 15th day of the month of Av. So this is talking about a past blood moon. It is interesting to note that a lunar eclipse, or a quote-unquote blood moon, can by definition only occur on the 15th day of a Jewish month, i.e. when there is a full moon. So on the Hebrew calendar, it's always going to happen on the 15th of, of the Hebrew month. And when we look again at the Hebrew calendar, let's look at some of these feast days. Okay, so... The first ones that we come across, well, I guess you could you could include uh, Purim. I don't care how it's pronounced. Don't don't correct my pronunciation. I don't care. Uh, Purim. You have the e Purim Eve, and then Purim itself, and then there's also there's a Shushan Purim or Purim, which is essentially it has to do. It, it gets into like when the Jews were in Persia and. Um, Anyway, this isn't a history lesson about that, but the 15th of Adar, it looks like, is Purim. So there's a full moon on that day. In April, or sorry, in Nisan, uh, which is usually in April, the 15th is associated with the first day of the Passover uh, week. Pasak 1 is on the 15th, so that's a full moon day. Um, okay, let's move forward. Uh, Pesach Sheni is on the 14th, so there's always a full moon uh, following Pesach Sheni. Okay. Pentecost is on the 6th and 7th, so it's never going to have, uh, the the Feast of Weeks is never going to have a full moon on it. Uh, here's Tubiav that the article is talking about. It's on the 15th of Av, so it's always going to have a full moon there. Rosh Hashanah is on the first and second. Now, even though it's the seventh month, uh, Tishri is the seventh month, For th that's when the date changes. That's just how it works. Even though Nisan is the first month, the date changes on the seventh month. That's just how they do it. So ju just accept it. Uh, so, uh, and then Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year in Judaism, is on the 10th. So, Full moons are not going to happen on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, but it will happen on uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Okay? So that's how it goes. So those are the, the possible days, possible Jewish feast days, observances, uh, holy days, whatever you want to call them. Those are the, those are the possible days that there would be a blood moon. Because those are the only days where you're going to have a full moon. Okay? So that's how that goes. Okay, let's go back here. Um, ordinarily, the Talmud tells us that a lunar eclipse is, is considered a bad sign for the Jews, since we calculate the months according to the lunar cycle. However, 
a full moon is considered to be a positive sign for the very same reason. In the end, we are reminded of the words of our sages that, quote, when Jews perform the will of God, they need not worry about omens or celestial phenomenon. Thus says the Lord, do not be frightened by the signs of the heavens. And, and we shouldn't be, especially if you're in your life, you're, you're trying to live a righteous life. You're keeping your covenants. You're doing what you, you're doing everything that you know the Lord wants you to do. We don't have to be perfect, but you know, we need to have our, our hearts pointed in the right direction. And so, yeah, um, you know, if you were to like, look at it like they do, then blood moons, you know, if, if it is a thing, and I think it yeah, it probably probably is. I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Uh, it, it's simply just a bad thing for the wicked. And if you're Jewish or if you're a member of the church and you're doing wickedly, it's pr probably not a good thing for you. Um, but anyway, that's I'm not saying that that's doctrine. That's not something that's taught in our church. But this is this is just something that's interesting. And the Lord could be could be communicating, or this might be simply be part of His order. Uh, the order in which he does things, right? So, um, so there you have it. That's what we have going on. Now, as far as what I was talking about earlier, how we have this uh, worldwide youth devotional uh, for young adults on the 15th, the day of the, the blood moon, there are fascinating, fascinating things that happen during these devotionals that are said. Uh, oh, sorry. Before I go on to that, I just wanted to point out, as I was doing a search, just re doing the research for this video, uh, the century's longest blood moon happened in, in 2018. Okay. That was President Nelson's first year as prophet. That year had the longest blood moon was when President Nelson became prophet. So think about if the Lord is using this as a sign and it's a it's a omen for the wicked, you know, if President Nelson is the prophet of the second coming, might make sense. It might make sense. And uh, I've, I've made the mistake before on the channel where I've been talking about all the all the special things that have happened on in um, 2017 because we've talked about 17 a lot on the channel. I was wrong about when the embassy was moved to Jerusalem, the U.S. embassy moved to Jerusalem. That, that was a huge event, okay? And it's interesting because it didn't happen in 2018 or 2017. It happened in 2018. And th this article here is talking about how uh, evangelicals, you know, they've, a lot of them have really followed the blood moons and they've noted, uh, noted that, you know, right here it says linking the celestial event to the U.S. Embassy move to Jerusalem, and they may not be wrong about that. And again, it's interesting that if President Nelson is the prophet of the second coming, uh, I guess it's kind of fitting that the U.S. Embassy would move to Jerusalem the same year that that he becomes prophet, right? Recognizing Jerusalem as the capital. Because we know that during the during the millennium, we're going to have the two capitals. We're going to have New Jerusalem in the Americas. We're going to have Old Jerusalem. Those are the two capitals. In the year that he becomes prophet, the United States, uh, in a way, symbolically, well, maybe not so much symbolically, they recognize Jerusalem as the capital and move the embassy to Jerusalem. Fascinating. Okay, so let's look at these... Um, just a few examples, some interesting things that have been said during these worldwide devotionals. Okay, first, uh, one of the most fascinating things that maybe has ever been said <laughs> in a devotional. This is uh, Wendy Nelson becoming the person you were born to be. This is a worldwide youth devotional for young adults, January tenth, twenty sixteen, uh, at BYU Hawaii. Okay, so that's where it's taking place. President Nelson is not President Nelson yet. He is Elder Nelson, although he is, uh, I think at that time, he was probably president of the of the um, Quorum of the Twelve. So, okay, at the end of her talk, you know, so many of you are already familiar with this. She says, 
Now, a question as I conclude. What if you learned that the Savior had already returned to this earth? That he, as part of his second coming, because again, the second coming has many different events associated with it, including multiple appearances of the, of the Savior himself. So what if you were to learn that he, as part of his second coming, had already met with some of his true followers in several marvelous, large gatherings? Gatherings about which the world, including CNN and the blogosphere, knew nothing about. If you found out that the Savior had already was already on the earth, what would you desperately want to do today? You know, what would you be willing and ready to do tomorrow? So that's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? Um, she has a footnote here, footnote 13. We've, we've read this a couple times on the channel already. It takes you to Bruce R. McConkie's Millennial Messiah, where he is essentially talking about uh, Adam and Yaman being broken up between different sessions and not all in one place. Of course, like the main the main thing would happen at Adam and Yaman, but he suggests in his book that there would be multiple sessions across all the different continents. Okay, and that's what what she's referencing here. She she references that exact page as she says this. So that's why I have to wonder. You know, is it something that takes place over just one weekend? Uh, does it take place over a month, a year, maybe a couple years? I don't know. I haven't read anything that's said how long exactly it's supposed to take. Uh, there's the rumor that I've talked about on the channel before. Someone claims to, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I don't necessarily take it too seriously, but someone claims to have attended uh, one of the sessions last or, or, yeah, last year in 2021. I'm not pushing that at all, but I'm not also not going to just like reject it. Uh, it could have happened. I don't know. We looked at the tracker and I was looking for, I was looking for phrases and words that had to do with being resurrected. And we observed something really interesting here it is right here. So someone had said that, here it is, God is among us, that Elder Uchtdorf in his talk, he his talk was called God is Among Us, and it was in 2021, so last year, the, the supposed year of the the initial or the first sessions of Adam and Amen. Now, I'm not, if, if it is true, I'm not concerned that I haven't been there because, again, there might be sessions just for small groups of people at first, varying sizes. Maybe later it's for the whole church. Okay, I I, I already know. Oh gosh, I, I can already hear the angry typing. No, no, it's not going to happen that way. I know exactly how it's going to happen, and that's wrong. You're misleading the people. Um, I'm just going to say I don't know for sure, and. I don't see anything that would say that it hasn't happened. And I've stu we have studied Adam and Ayaman, uh pretty at length. I have, I have a whole playlist that's dedicated to Adam and Ayaman. We've read things from, from Bruce R. McConkie and others. So I haven't seen anything so far that would exclude that possibility. That it started last year. Not finished, but maybe simply started. So anyway, we've noted here, you see this like this dark line up here in 2021. These are all resurrection and God lives and, or sorry, Christ lives and that kind of talk. All of a sudden in 2021, uh, all across the board, you have this spike of um, basically Christ being resurrected talk. So I find it interesting that that's not to say that it has happened, but for some reason last year, they started talking about this kind of stuff a lot. Okay. So that's what she said in 2016. She hinted at the multiple sessions of Adam on Diamond. Now, President Nelson, uh, he, okay, here it is right here. 
President Nelson on the, of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. So he was president of the Quorum of the Twelve at that time. Uh, during this same event, he spoke, and he gave an incredible talk called Becoming True Millennials, where he uh, essentially explicitly tells uh, the audience that the, 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 the title Millennials as a gen generation is perfect because you're actually going to be living in the millennium. So let me just read a few things that he says here. When I pray about you and ask the Lord how he feels about you, I feel something is something far different from what the researchers say, talking about the millennial generation. Spiritual, spiritual impressions I've received about you lead me to believe that the term millennial may actually be perfect for you, for a much different reason than the experts may ever understand. The term millennial is perfect for you if that term reminds you of who you really are and what your purpose in life really is. A true millennial is one who has taught, who was taught and did teach the gospel of Jesus Christ primordially, and who made covenants with our Heavenly Father there about courageous things, even morally courageous things that you would do while here on earth. A true millennial is a man or a woman whom God trusted enough to send to earth during the most compelling dispensation in the history of this world. A true millennial is a man or woman who lives now to help prepare the people for his second cup or for the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ and his millennial reign. Make no mistake about it, you were born to be a true millennial. And then he says other things. He says, My first recommendation. Uh, my first recommendation, learn who you really are. In this third bullet point, it says, you were taught in the spirit world to prepare for anything and everything you would encounter during this latter part of these latter days. Latter part of these latter days. And then he says, you are living in the quote unquote 11th hour. The Lord has declared that this is the last time he will call laborers into his vineyard to gather the elect from the four quarters of the earth. Um, I think there may have been something else here. Let me see if I can find it. My beloved brothers and sisters, you were born to be true millennials. You are a chosen generation foredetermined by God to do remarkable work to help prepare the people of this world for the second coming of the Lord. Okay. And there's, there's more in there. I think I lost some of the highlights, but these, these are highlights from a while ago. They're, they're just like still saved. Okay. And then, and also pretty incredible worldwide devotional this time for the youth called hope of Israel. And since this was, since this one happened, it's been referenced so many times uh, between general conference talks, Liahona articles, and other places. They're always referring back to this devotional in 2018 for the youth. It's called Hope of Israel. And some pretty stunning things are said in it. Let me just share a few of them. Okay. Uh, while that question simmers on your mind, let's shift and talk about why you are here on earth at this particular time. And he puts it in italics, uh, which is such a unique time in the history of the earth. Why are you here on earth right now? Why were you not born back in the 1880s? And just as a side note, in the 1880s, the church was already established. It had already been established for 50 years by that point. So, so why weren't you back in the, the pioneer days or the, you know, the early days of the church? Or why not 30 years from now? M most likely, again, as a side point, because maybe uh, by that point, the second coming will have already happened. <laughs> so interesting dates for, for him to, to say. So why were you not born back in the 1880s or 30 years from now? Let me tell you of an experience that taught me firsthand about the historic days in which we live. We often talk about living in the latter days. We are, after all, latter-day saints, but perhaps these days are more quote-unquote 
ladder than we have ever imagined. We should really stop and think about that. Okay, we should really stop and think about that. Oh, by the way, sorry, this is Sister Nelson that's talking. We should really stop and think about that. Uh, this truth became a reality for me because of what I experienced during one 24-hour period that commenced on June 15th, 2013. My husband and I were in Moscow, Russia. While President Nelson met with priesthood leaders, I had the privilege of meeting with nearly 100 of our sisters. I love our Russian sisters. They are spectacular. When I stepped up to the pulpit to speak, I found myself saying something I'd never anticipated. I said to the women, I'd like to know you by lineage. Please stand as the tribe of Israel that represents the lineage declared in your patriarchal blessing is spoken. Benjamin, a couple of women stood. Dan, a couple more. Reuben, a few more stood. N uh, Naphtali, or Naphtali, however you want to pronounce that, more stood. As the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were announced from Asher to Zebulun, and as the I like that. That's A to Z. I never <laughs> realized that before. And as the women, women stood, we were all amazed that we were witnessing what we were witnessing, feeling, and learning. How many of the, tr the 12 tribes of Israel do you think were represented in that small gathering of fewer than 100 women on that Saturday in, Ma in Moscow? 11. 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel were represented in that one room. The only tribe missing was that of Levi. I was astonished. I was this, it was a spiritually moving moment for me. Immediately after those meetings, my husband and I went directly to Yerevan, Armenia. The first people we met as we got off the plane were the mission president and his wife. Somehow, she had learned about this experience in Moscow, and with great delight, she said, I've got Levi. Just imagine our thrill when my husband and I met their missionaries the next day, including an elder from the tribe of Levi, who just appear, who just happened to be from Gilbert, Arizona. Now, when I was a little girl attending, attending primary in Raymond, Alberta, I learned that in the last days before the second coming of the Savior, the 12 tribes of Israel would be gathered. Okay. That truth was thrilling to me. And... At the same time, quite overwhelming to wrap, wrap my mind around. So imagine what it was like for me to be with members of all 12 tribes of Israel within one 24-hour period of time. Now, it's interesting because I did an anonymous um, poll here on the channel uh, of what tribes of Israel everybody was from uh, based on their, their patriarchal blessing. So I got the responses back. And 91.7% of people that responded to the poll, which probably isn't very accurate uh, if you were to compare it to worldwide poll numbers, if, if there was such a thing, or worldwide statistics of the church. But 91.7 were Ephraim, but we had 20 from Manasseh, 7 from just Joseph, because I guess some people for some reason, they aren't assigned to either Ephraim or Manasseh, just Joseph. So I, I don't understand that. Um, four from Benjamin, two from Judah, one Reuben, one Simeon, one Levi, one Dan, one Gad, one Issachar. So I didn't get all 12 of them, but they're out there. They are out there. Okay, let's go back here. My dear brothers and sisters, these are indeed the latter days. There has never, in italics, there has never been a time like this in the history of the world. Never. Okay, then it switches over to President Nelson. He says, my dear young brothers and sisters, these surely are, in italics, the, later, the latter days, and the Lord is hastening his work to gather Israel. Uh, down here, he says, just think of the excitement and urgency of it all. Every prophet, commencing with Adam, has seen our day. And every prophet has talked about our day, in italics, when Israel would be gathered and the world would be prepared for the second coming of the Savior. Think of it. Of all the people who have ever lived on planet Earth, we, in italics, are the ones who get to participate in this final great gathering event. How exciting is that? 
Our Heavenly Father has reserved many of his most noble spirits, perhaps I might say his finest team, for this final phase. Final phase. Those noble spirits, those finest players, those heroes are you in italics. Okay, there's more, if I remember right. Okay, my dear extraordinary youth, you were sent to earth at this precise time, the most crucial time in the history of the world to help gather Israel. There is nothing in italics happening on this earth right now that is more important than that. There is nothing in italics of greater consequence. Absolutely nothing in italics. This gathering should mean everything in italics to you. This is the mission for which you were sent to earth. So my question to you is, are you willing to enlist in the youth battalion of the Lord to help gather Israel? Right here, the Lord's youth battalion. This is the first time that this concept is introduced. It's during this devotional. Now remember, I'm looking at these devotionals because we have this one coming up really soon, just a few days from now. Who knows what's going to be said during this one? But I'm going to watch it. I hope you watch it too. I wouldn't be surprised if similarly incredible things are said. Okay. All right. Uh, think of this, my dear young brothers and sisters. Right now, I am preparing for the day when I will be required to give an accounting to the Prophet Joseph Smith, to President Brigham Young, and others, and ultimately to the Lord about my stewardship as God's prophet upon the earth today. What does that sound like? To me, it sounds like two things. One is possibly just after this life, right? He is old. However, it, you know, whatever the case, this would seem to me that he's referring to Adam and Yaman. We know that all the resurrected saints, the righteous, those that have held uh, priesthood keys, uh, they're going to be there. So whether he's there in resurrected form or literally during his mortal life, I don't know. But it would seem that he's referring to Adam and Amon right here, where uh, where this accounting takes place that he's talking about. It seems to me that he's he's talking about Adam and Amon. So if the initial sessions did happen in 2021, and that's why we have all this resurrected talk, and God is among us, he is risen, Christ lives, the tomb, uh, that he lives, uh, I don't, that might explain it. Not saying that that's the case, but so, I mean, this is just a few years before 2021. Then he says, so now I am inviting every young woman and every young man between the ages of 12 and 18 in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to enlist in the youth battalion of the Lord to help gather Israel. Well, guess what? I put together a spreadsheet for that too. And at the time of this, at, let's see, let's zoom into it. At the time of that devotional, th this is the breakdown right here. So if you were 18 at that time, uh, and this is just for young men. Uh, so if you were 18 at that time, then you started your mission that year, right? And then 17 year olds would have started their mission roughly in 2019. And so right now in 2022, anyone who was about 14 years old at that time as a young, young man, they're starting their missions right now. And it's going to go on until 2025, and that's that would be the last group that would have participated in the 2018 Worldwide Youth Devotional. Does that make sense? So 2025, that's the last year that anyone that would have heard that devotional, participated in it, uh, would be starting their missions as, as young men. Okay? So here it is right here. The tab, if you want to go, the link for this spreadsheet and this whole workbook, it's in the description of every video. And the tab for it is, it's called Youth. Okay? It's called Youth, if you want to look at this. Um, or you could just pause it. There, there's not really much to it. 
Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go on down. As I conclude, I invite you to stand with the youth from all around the world and experience the thrill of being a member of the Lord's Youth Battalion in Zion's army by singing our closing hymn, Hope of Israel, because this hymn is all about you. And then he concludes by saying, you are, in italics, you are the hope of Israel, children of the promised day, in quotes. So, again, uh, for this one, uh, the one by Elder Rasban, which was only one of six that were happening at the same time, six different apostles. It, it was interesting. The, one, of the, one of the things that stood out to me was that he compared President Nelson to Samuel the Lamanite. And we all know that Samuel the Lamanite, he's the one that warned the people about Christ coming in five years. Am I suggesting that that's what he's saying about President Nelson? Like, oh, President Nelson is is a sign that it's going to happen in five years. Uh, no, but it might be pretty close or just as close as Samuel the Lamanite was to when Christ came when he was born. You might be able to compare that to President Nelson and how close we are to when Christ comes. Uh, like, just relatively speaking. Uh, Elder Bednar, he also, he said something similar I think it was, I want to say it was the 2015 Christmas devotional where he said that. He he asked the congregation, imagine that you, uh, let's, let's say that uh, Samuel the Lamanite was here today and he said that we had five years. Uh, he basically made like another kind of comparison like that. And it's actually made me want to look for Samuel the Lamanite and put it on the tracker to see if like, they're talking about Samuel the Lamanite more now than they have in the past. So I'll put that on the tracker and see what we come up with. But that's going to be for another video. So, but anyway, if you want to watch this devotional, or if you want to listen to the notes that I took watching the devotional, you can watch either one of these videos. I'll put it in the description below. Uh, <laughs> sorry, so this was kind of a long video. Um, but that, that's what we have, okay? So we have a blood moon happening on the 15th, and we're having a worldwide young adult devotional on that same day. Uh, incredible things could be said during that time. Uh, it may relate to the last chance, the second chance, Pesach Sheni. We have Shavuot, or Pentecost, the, the Harvest Festival, the, the Festival of Weeks coming up on June 5th and 6th. Will anything happen on those days? I don't know. But the first day of it is on a Sunday, so that's kind of perfect. Uh, just that it's on, you know, a Sunday. It's the Sabbath. I don't know. I don't know. But here's some stuff for you to consider, to think about. All we can really do is watch and see what actually happens. Maybe nothing will happen this year. Maybe something will. I don't know. We'll just see. Okay, that's going to be it for this one. So, hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it. Put your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share this. Um, especially anyone that, anyone that needs a second chance. Uh, I, I doubt that this would wake anybody up, but maybe it could. And I'll talk to you guys later.